Hey everybody, uh, this week we are going to talk about the ways in which art can be used to scam people. Um, <clears throat> I, I can't really do anything just sort of, you know, polite and nice and stuff. And so I, I've got to, you know, figure out ways how, how to, uh, you know, incorporate underhandedness in, in most of my lectures. So, um, and uh, during, during the Civil War, as well as uh, shortly after the end of the Civil War, uh, the nation is very, very much in mourning. Uh, there are tremendous, tremendous losses during, during the war itself. Uh, so much so that if you look at you know, some of those uh, interesting graphs about America's war dead, uh, the total number of dead as a result of the American Civil War, as far as military losses goes, uh, is going to eclipse all of the other military uh, conflicts that the United States has been involved with combined. So uh, there's a tremendous, tremendous uh, loss of life during the war. And it, it kind of depends on who you ask and don't really worry about the, the numbers, remembering these numbers specifically. I just kind of throw them up there um, just to kind of get at the, the impact of this. But depending on who you ask and, and what measure that they're using, uh, estimates are from six, around 650,000 people lost during the Civil War upwards to 700 to 700, I've seen some as high as 700 to 20,000. Uh, the rationale behind this is that at the time of the war, uh, they would only count killed in action as people that were actually killed in combat. Uh, if you were wounded and you died a couple of weeks later as a result of your wounds, you would still be counted as wounded in action uh, and not killed in action. So uh, I'm not exactly how sure how the military does that today, you know, as far as if someone dies of their wounds, you know, a couple of years later, would that still count as, as a military loss? Uh, but, uh, you know, even today, though, if somebody was wounded and died of their wounds a couple of weeks later, maybe a month later, I I'm thinking that those people are definitely counted, <laughs> thinking that they are definitely counted. Yeah, I'm contradicting myself all over the place there. But they would be counted as killed in action because, you know, uh, they died shortly afterwards. So that's why you get that, that kind of interesting discrepancy. Um, if we counted the way that we do today, it would be 700 to 720,000 people that were killed during the war. Um, anyway, uh, during the war, it's, uh, well, actually a little bit before the war, uh, photography emerges uh, about maybe 10 to 15 years before the war, I believe, uh, daguerreotypes are, uh, are going to debut. They are very small sort of tin type photographs. During the war, we get to a more modern sense of photography. Uh, these are called wet plate photo. This is wet plate photography. Uh, the image is printed on a, uh, when you take the picture, uh, the, the image is captured, there you go, onto a glass plate. And then the, uh, that's kind of going to work as your negative and then you'll print off copies uh, from that wet plate. Well, a big thing at this time is this is an extremely, extremely slow speed film. And, and a lot of us are like, wait, what the heck are you talking about? Slow speed film. Uh, back when, when we used to use actual film for cameras. Um, I think most uh, photographs now are, are taken digitally. I don't even know really where you would go and buy film. I'm pretty sure you can find literal film in, in places for film cameras, but uh, I, I don't know where you would go to find that. Um, but this film is slow speed film. And so any kind of movement that you are going to capture on your image is just going to be a blur. 
So you used to have to buy, and, and I don't, digital photography probably works pretty close to the same way. I am not really super into that, so I don't know. But uh, used to, you could buy slow speed film and then high speed film. I think standard film was like 100 speed, and that would capture somebody walking, you know, or something like that. But if somebody is like speeding by in a car, uh, that's going to be a blur for that cam for that film. And so you'll need to get high speed film, you know, like six or 700 f speed film to capture something like that. Well, right now we are on sort of, you know, for lack of a better term, extremely slow speed film. You have to stay absolutely, absolutely still. And so a lot of you know, Civil War photographs are taken of people being as absolutely still as they possibly can. You don't. I, I, I have personally, I'm a Civil War historian. Like this is, this is my area. Uh, I've only seen maybe two, um, possibly three images of soldiers on the march uh, from the Civil War. Because even just marching at a slow march, you know, regular speed march, that would be a, a big blur for the camera. And, and it's, it's kind of cool actually, because it, it sort of creates this kind of cool ghostly image. And um, so, you know, nothing, no movement really can be captured. Um, in, in this image here, you can see, um, if you can see my cursor on here, there's on the, uh, the right side, the second guy where you can see his full face, um, the dude next to him, he's kind of blurred because he probably moved a little bit. Um, you know, the people in the background there are definitely, some of those people are moving around a little bit because absolutely anything uh, is going to cause a blur. Um, so this, uh, this, drawing over here on the the other the right right side the extreme right side uh, that's called an immobilizer uh usually i i've never seen one uh in person as far as the the full body one there where you can stand i have seen the ones that are mounted on the back of a chair and it just runs up the back of the chair and it, it clamps your head right there in one spot so that you don't accidentally you know kind of move your head or even just kind of you know slightly turn your head or anything because it will ruin the, the image um, as a result you know of of that you know you don't have live action um, images during the war there's no real big images of combat or anything it's it's dangerous as well but you know you don't really get too many Im images of combat so a lot of times images of battlefields are taken after the battle is over. And so you get those on the left there. Uh, you have a lot of, you know, uh, dead soldiers uh, that are taken during, after various battles on, on a couple of battlefields. Uh, those are pretty easy to find uh, on Google image search and stuff like that. But <clears throat> Kind of the real reason that we're here, sort of weird background on photography a little bit. Photography is brand, brand new. We're not, you know, the general public, this is a new and exciting, wondrous contraption that we're, we're you know, being exposed to. Also, at the same time, you have a tremendous number of people that have lost their lives during this, the American Civil War, 650 to 720,000 people. And, and loads and loads of people have been horribly wounded and, and their lives are gonna be changed again, forever. And so the nation is, is undergoing this kind of national mourning, you know, especially, you know, while the war is going on, but especially after the war as it ended. And so a lot of people are, you know, really kind of heartbroken and, and experiencing tremendous, tremendous loss. Um, my hometown, I'm, I'm originally from Winchester, Tennessee. My hometown had uh, in 1860, the opening months of 1861, 
uh, about 1,300 young men enlisted in the first Tennessee to march off to war, which they thought was going to be this glorious and, and very short war. Um, in 1865, around 200-ish came back, and that was about it. So, and, and I'm from a small town, and that was, you know, a large sellout of the population. So, national mourning is, is being experienced. Um, since that's the case, uh, this is going to sound harsh, but it's unfortunately true. Sad people are easy marks. Uh, you can take advantage of sad people that are experiencing loss because they're not quite thinking as, as swiftly as they usually do. They're, they're not quite, you know, they're distracted by something else that's going on. And so unfortunately it's, easier to take advantage of folks like that. Um, and so shortly after the debut of photography, uh, a photographer up in Boston, a guy named William Mumler, is learning photography himself. He's figuring out how to do things and he accidentally stumbles on double exposures. Uh, double exposure uh, you know, is just you, you, for film, <laughs> uh, you can still do this with, with digital photography. It just kind of takes some doing a little bit, but for, for regular film, you take a picture and then you don't advance the film to the next slide. You take another picture on top of that same film slide and then you get a double exposure. And if you do it correctly, the one of the images will look a little bit ghostly because you're taking a second picture on top of that other picture. And so especially if you take it of the same exact scene, but you include a second person on the second shot, that, that other person is going to look a little bit ghostly. Their, their image is going to get washed out a little bit. And uh, Mumler accidentally uh, happens upon doing this. Now, we're historians, uh, historians of photography. We're not exactly sure what his procedure was. Um, you can recreate this with wet plate photography. People have done that. But we're not exactly sure exactly how William Mumler did this. Um, kind of getting ahead of the story a little bit, but he is taken to court later on, uh, on fraud charges, surprise. And uh, the court is going to, the prosecutors are going to try to say, you know, hey, you did this this way. And he's like, no, I didn't do it that way. And they're going to like come up with another solution. Well, we think you did it this way. And he's like, no, I didn't do it that way either. So he never reveals how he does this. And uh, he just constantly, you know, sticks to his story that he is capturing the, the images of your passed away loved ones. So we're in this period of, of national mourning. There's lots of really, really sad people. William Mumler is going to take advantage of them. Uh, think about this. If you have recently experienced loss or if you've experience loss at some point in your life, how much would you pay to really, really know that your loved one was still around? Like to actually have concrete evidence, not just faith in your head that there is something after this and all that kind of stuff, which that's cool, but how much would you pay to have actual evidence that you can hold in your hand? Uh, Mumler captures that. And um, a regular, you don't have to get the numbers down unless you just want to, but a regular photography session to purchase a portrait in 1861, 1865-ish was about 50 cents. Uh, probably depends on who you, who you sit for. If you sit for some average person, that's 50 cents. If you sit for Alexander Gardner, who is one of the most famous photographers in the United States, he might charge a little bit more. Um, he's regular, well, not regularly, but he photographs Lincoln a couple of times and he photographs all of the major uh, people of wealth in Washington, D.C. and New York and stuff. So sitting for Gardner is probably going to cost you a little bit more. But 
average person, you're going to pay 50 cents to get your picture taken. Uh, William Mumler charges $5. Um, and, and to kind of put that into perspective a little bit, the, a private in the United States Army in 1861 uh, makes $14 a month. And so this is almost a third of their income. Uh, but again, how much would you pay to know that your loved ones are still around, even if they passed on? And so Mumler, you know, gets the story out there that he and his special uh, photography equipment can capture the spirits of your loved ones. Uh, there is an image of Mr. Mumbler there with, you know, some sort of spirit. Again, he's probably very likely just doing this with a double exposure. Uh, here are a couple of other images on the next slide. Uh, I don't know the two people on the, uh, the outside, the far left and the far right in those photographs, but you know, there are a lot of young men that are missing at the table, the dinner table. And so a lot of people sit for Mr. Mumbler, not just uh, Civil War losses, just any losses, you know, but he's that's where he's going to kind of hone in on. And at the center there is Mary Todd Lincoln. Mary Todd Lincoln, the president of the United States' widow, sits for William Mumbler. And check it out. There's Abraham sitting standing right behind her. He's got his hands on her shoulders. Her husband is still there. This woman has lost her husband. She's also lost two children at this point. And, you know, she literally will, will experience a lot of mental instability. Um, her still surviving son will uh, commit her to a mental institution for a little while because she's having that tough of a go of it. Um, but, you know, so lots and lots of people are going to sit for Mumler. He is going to make a tremendous amount of money. He flies through it, but he's going to make a lot of money on, on you know, sort of taking advantage of this uh, national sense of mourning. Lots and lots of people are sad and they've got cash is his logic here. So um, now we do have people, thankfully, uh, just like today that push back on, you know, these kind of efforts to take advantage of people and to rip people off. Unfortunately, those voices, uh, you know, get lost in the mix a lot of the time. But uh, we do have a couple here. Uh, Henry Robin is a photographer and a skeptic that he comes out and, um, you know, try, tries to sort of explain what William Mumler is doing. And he prints a bunch of these kind of, uh, you know, Henry Robin and the Spectre uh, kind of imagery and stuff to, to just show that these are just fake images. They're, well, not fake images, but they're not real spirits anyway. Um, I just ran across Henry Robin as I was preparing for this particular, um, epi you know, this particular uh, bit. Uh, I, I didn't know about him before. Um, so those voices, unfortunately, the, the skeptical, the debunkers, they get lost in, in the mix. Um, I did hear about uh, Phineas T. Barnum, uh, our other image there. Barnum was a well-known hoaxer. He let people know that they're being, uh, you know, kind of fooled. If you go and see something from Barnum, usually, uh, not so much in his early years. In his early years, he did kind of do some really underhanded stuff. He does some underhanded stuff later as well, but as far as, you know, knowing that you're being fooled and stuff, Barnum kind of allows that message, I guess, or, or maybe even promotes that message to get out that he's absolutely, you know, trying to fool you. He's, he's trying to kind of play with your, your senses a little bit, but, uh, 
while Mumler is is going on his big, you know, sort of show about that he can capture the spirits of your dead loved ones, and then Mary Todd Lincoln gets her image taken with her husband Abraham's uh, ghost <laughs> in the background. Barnum does the same thing. Uh, Barnum is figures out a way to fairly close get uh, an image of Abraham Lincoln into a, a photograph of him. And, you know, he, Barnum doesn't have any sort of personal relationship. And so there's no reason why, if you're into the ghost stuff, that Abraham Lincoln would visit Barnum for an image, you know, something like that. And so uh, they do try to push back against these things. Um, especially on issues like this, uh, I, I like to kind of show that we still fall for this kind of stuff. We are still human beings that experience grief and experience loss. And since we do, we're sometimes easy marks. And so people do try to rip us off and, and try to take advantage of our sadness and our losses and stuff like that. So uh, here are a couple of people that I've seen uh, that, that do this, not Penn and Teller, but the other two people, um, probably back in, I don't know, 2000-ish was the first time I ran across John Edward. Uh, he used to be on, I think he was on the Sci-Fi Channel, which was kind of, I guess, apt. <laughs> um, but John Edward, uh, currently claims that he talks to dead people and that, that they show him images and stuff like that and, and he communicates with the, the, the communicates with the dead um you can uh look up some videos of his on youtube and and you know on first glance they do appear very convincing uh Another person, I've never seen any of her shows, but she did a uh, show here in Huntsville at the Von Braun Center, uh, I think in 2022. Um, so it, it might have been earlier this year, 2023. I uh, can't remember, but she has been to Huntsville. Uh, the Long Island medium, Teresa Caputo, does the same thing. She does the same thing as John Edward. Um, and people go to her. You know, people go and pay these folks money to speak to, you know, the dead, uh, the speak to, um, stand up live in Huntsville. Uh, they, I don't know if they've had her on recently, but they, uh, maybe a couple of years ago had a medium from Nashville come down and she would do the same thing. All of these things, all of these people that are claiming to talk and speak to the dead and you know, people pay them to do so. This is just a, what's called a cold read. You go into an audience and you say, you know, hey, there's a male father figure coming through. Uh, it could be an uncle, brother, cousin, some sort of an older male figure. And, you know, you kind of go through the story and stuff. I do this in class. Um, I, I do a psychic reading thing in class. And I've been doing that since about 2008. Since 2008, I've only had one class where I did not make this sort of connection to the other world. I don't have any psychic powers, but I'm able to do this because it's, it's just a cold read and you can find scripts and stuff on, online and, and various places. Uh, Penn and Teller did a, a really, really good episode on their show bullshit about this this issue they they do a lot of, of kind of skepticism and debunking and stuff uh, on their entire series when i don't believe it's on anymore but uh you can you can pull up uh uh that episode uh, of bullshit on i think it was called psychic mediums or something and they take you through the process of how to do this of how to rip people off um, please don't rip people off and, and use this for ill, but it is a good party trick. It is, it is something fun to do at parties and stuff like that. So if you're not taking advantage, I don't really see the harm, but anyway, the message is though, that we still fall for this stuff. Uh, do remember William Mumler and, and his adventures, uh, on ripping people off. Uh, 
since we are, we're going to kind of jump away from photography, but we're going to stick with P.T. Barnum. Um, a little bit after the Civil War, uh, Barnum is running around and he is putting on this show. And uh, up north, I believe it's in Ohio. I don't have my notes in front of me and, and that's kind of dumb of me. Sorry about that. But a couple of guys claim to have uncovered something called the Cardiff Giant. Uh, they said that they were out digging in the middle of a field and they were digging a, uh, a well out in the middle of this field and they uncovered a complete 10 foot tall giant uh, that was petrified. We're, we're getting into the age of starting to discover dinosaurs, dinosaur skeletons. We're starting to slowly sort of realize what fossilization sort of is. This is not that, but we're kind of getting into the whole fossils and stuff like that. So these guys claim to have uncovered a giant because there was uh, the idea that some parts of the United, this is not true, but there was an idea that some parts of the United States were once inhabited by giants. Uh, Thomas Jefferson, when he sent Lewis and Clark uh, out to the American West in 1800, one of the things that they were supposed to look out for was the supposed race of Native American giants. There, there were never any giants out there, but you know there was the idea that, oh my gosh, there, there might be giants out there. Thomas Jefferson also thought that there were, you know, woolly mammoths still running around. And to be fair, you know, he didn't know. And a lot of people in the American East did not know what was out there on the Great Plains. And so this was kind of undiscovered country. Uh, so there, there's, we kind of have to, I don't, I feel like I have to have a little bit of understanding that, you know, maybe it might have been out there. You know, it definitely wasn't, but, you know, Coming from Jefferson, you know, maybe it's understandable that he thought that this was a possibility. So anyway, uh, a couple of guys uncover this uh, supposed giant, petrified giant. They dig it up. They make a big show about it. And they start charging admission uh, to see the Cardiff giant. Uh, that's a, a picture of the Cardiff giant. The Cardiff giant is anat anatomically correct. Um, it probably would have been fine to not put the, uh, the little blue oval there. Everybody knows what's under the big, the little blue oval. I just feel like if you want to see that, you can easily go and Google the Cardiff giant. Um, I pulled that picture off of Wikipedia. So if you want to see the complete anatomically correct Cardiff giant, you know, go to Wikipedia and, and he's on there. I just kind of felt like if you don't want to see that, Maybe, you know, I can cover it up and it's not a big whoop for me. Uh, so anyhow, but, you know, it's out there if, if that's what you want to see. But also, hey, I'm nice. Try to be considered if you don't. So these guys uh, start charging people to come and see the Cardiff Giant. They make a big show of uncovering it. And uh, they start charging people to come and see the Cardiff Giant claiming that this is a legitimately real petrified human being. Um, now, if you know anything about fossilization, I know a very tiny, tiny amount. Soft tissue does not fossilize for the most part. Uh, we really kind of fossils, the, the soft flesh has, you know, rotted away and we're basically dealing with skeletons. And so, you know, the Cardiff giant guy here, definitely is not going to petrify that or fossilize that way. So, uh, but they start selling out. I mean, they are just making a tremendous, tremendous amount of money. So much so that Barnum finds out, he hears about this story and how much money that they are making. He has done a similar thing in the past uh, where he has, you know, sort of scammed people a little bit and convinced them that's, you know, someone with something else and, and charged admission for that. And it made a tremendous amount of money. So Barnum, you know, tries to purchase the Cardiff giant from these two guys. They refuse to sell. 
Uh, they're and understandably, they're making a lot of money. Why should they sell to P.T. Barnum so that he can then make money off of this? They might as well ride this wave until it doesn't work anymore. So Barnum has someone. This is one of those underhanded things where I was like, Barnum sometimes gets an underhanded stuff. Barnum has a couple of people go in, pay admission to the Cardiff Giant, and they are going to quietly and secretly, uh, sort of surreptitiously, sort of model the giant uh, roughly in clay while they are looking it over. And then when they leave, uh, these folks that he has to go see it are sculptors. They will copy full size the card of giant from these little models that they've made. And then he proclaims that he has the real card of giant. Uh, those two guys, the original discoverers of the original card of giant, sue Barnum in court. Barnum countersues, and both sides in court are claiming to have a legitimate petrified giant human being. Um, several paleontologists, one of the earliest paleontologists in the United States, um, Edward Cope actually examines both of these and, and says, you know, these are, these are not real. They're just sculptures. Uh, you know, flesh wouldn't fossilize this way, wouldn't petrify this way. This is not a real thing. The judge ultimately rules, you know, he sort of throws out the, yeah, he throws out the case and says, you know, neither one of these two are an actual thing. These are both just scams. And so for you to both be suing, saying that this is the real card of giant is, is kind of, silly. And so, uh, but both sides are going to continue to display their card of giant, uh, to try to rip off people, not really rip off people, but, you know, kind of fool people into thinking that a race of giants sort of once, uh, wandered around the American countryside. So, um, I believe that uh, at least one of the original Cardiff Giants uh, is still in a museum somewhere. So if you uh, are interested, you can go and kind of check that out. But, you know, the, the kind of the purpose of this, uh, this little bit was that, you know, we can use art to scam people. We can use art to grift. Uh, when it's done, you know, this is just me talking, but when it's done kind of sort of without a victim, like the card of giant kind of stuff. I guess there's a victim there, but it's not really uh, that serious of a victim. Uh, that's kind of a weird, you know, let's kind of categorize victimization. Uh, but I don't really have a problem with card of giant, but I do have a problem with taking advantage of someone's grief. Uh, and I, I think that the things that Long Island Medium and John Edwards and stuff do or they're taking advantage of people's griefs. And William Mumler from much, much earlier. That, that's more in the wrong camp. So anyway, uh, we'll have a discussion on this. And, and uh, you guys chime in and let me know what you think about this or one of the other discussions that we posted this week. Thanks.